Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Joining us for the second half of our show is Ken Rendell, founder and director of the Museum of World War II. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you. Ken, I recently had the pleasure of visiting your World War II museum right here in Natick, Massachusetts. It must be one of the best-kept secrets in New England. I do want to go through that with you, but I was fascinated with your own history as a renowned professional collector and dealer in historical documents. Take us back to your early days. I understand your interest in collecting came when you were 10 years old in your father's drugstore. Yes, my father had a drugstore in Alston, and one day someone came in and spent an 1806 half dollar, which is a little larger than a normal one. And my mother gave me the coin. Um, I offered it to various coin dealers in Boston. This was in 1954, and I sold it for three dollars and a half. <laughs> And I used the $3.50 as my starting capital to get coins out of bubblegum machines and find pennies that I could sell for $0.10, which was a huge markup, but it was labor-intensive. But that's how I got my start. Then when I was 17 years old, I saw a collection of presidential letters, and I thought that was the most intimate view of history, the window into people's real lives. Well, what they wrote in letters, and you had it in their own handwriting, you had their thoughts, their fears, their hopes. This was just a golden opportunity for me. What's interesting is that you parlayed that first half dollar into what must have been a very successful business, given the amount of philanthropy you've done in establishing the museum. Tell us a little about the trajectory of going from a personal collection to becoming a dealer. Well, it was a necessity. We had no money, and uh, I couldn't afford to collect anything. So I thought it would be better to be the temporary owner of things, the temporary collector, and then pass them on to people who appreciated them. And little by little, I was able to put things aside for myself. And in, in one of my great moves, as soon as I started making any money in the coin business, I went back to the dealer I sold the half dollar to, and I bought it back for $5. <laughs> and it sits on my desk uh, and has been sitting there for 60 years. Well, that must be a great inspiration. It is. It, uh, it's always there. Now, eventually, you opened galleries in New York and Beverly Hills and Tokyo. What sort of clients did you serve? Our standard collectors were intelligent people who had interests in things other than themselves. Basically, people who read books, had favorite authors, had periods of time they were interested in, and the letters and documents opened those windows. They were the most intimate view that anyone could gain into what fascinated them. It was the same appeal that I had found myself with letters and documents. Did you ever have any famous customers? Many. Tell us about some of them. Generally, I'm, I'm very careful not to talk about sure. too many of them. I had an agreement with Bill Gates that I would never talk about him. But then in the Time Magazine cover story, he talked about me. <laughs> so we had to, uh, adjust it. We had to adjust the, the agreement about not talking. But generally, people like Bill Gates, people who have been very successful and clever and, but have interests outside of, their own world. Has it been mostly documents or other artifacts as well? It's always been basically documents and letters, not artifacts. Can you share anything about any of your other customers? Well, it can be difficult. In, in a feature story in town and country, they needed five names. And uh, I gave them Malcolm Forbes and Queen Elizabeth and several other people. <laughs> Ken, along the way, you became an expert in forgery detection. I see that you even founded a course at Columbia University on, on scientific methods for forgery detection. Tell us about that. That was really based on the general thing in the art world, the, the artifact world of people just giving quick opinions about whether something is authentic or what period of time it is. 
and their explanation always was, well, they just know it. Mm. And I was determined to break down male intuition because essentially when you're giving an instant answer like that, you're reflecting what you're seeing off of tens of thousands of images that you have in your brain. So if something looks really different in terms of the paper or the the ink or the writing style, when you're instantly comparing it to all of your experience, people would will come up with that quick answer. And I wanted to show that it's much more scientific and it, it's much more analytical than that. And I went on to write a book, Forging History, which is the standard reference book in the field. So this included technological elements as well, didn't it? Only to the degree of of basically using ultraviolet light is a fairly standard thing to spot alterations. Ink can be analyzed, but ink can be faked very well, knowing when pens were manufactured so that you can identify if you have a 1900 letter written with a ballpoint pen, (laughs) something is dramatically wrong. I remember back in the early 1980s that West German magazine Stern published excerpts from what they claimed were Hitler's diaries. You were hired to figure out whether they were fakes. How did that investigation go? Like a comedy show. (laughs) It was based on uh, three people had authenticated the Hitler diaries. And the handwriting in the Hitler diaries actually didn't resemble Hitler at all. What had happened was that the forger had planted his own forgeries in the federal archives in Germany. So when these experts Uh went to compare the handwriting, it did match. Of course it matched (laughs) because it was all done by the forger. But institutions, when they're given gifts, and there's no financial part to the transaction, they just accept things, put them in a box. It was a very interesting situation of planting evidence. Very clever. It was very clever, but it also was an enormous failure of journalism because the forger had only done one volume and he sold it to an industrialist. And then Stern Magazine found out about this and they tracked down the person who sold the diary by tapping the telephone of the industrialist. And when they went to him, they said, there must be more. So he said, okay. (laughs) And they said, well, he must have done one at least every month. And he said, sure. (laughs) And as he produced them, they wanted more. He said, well, you know, he did one every month. And when they asked where they came from, he said, well, he couldn't say. And they said, they must come from East Germany. That's why you can't tell us. And he said, oh, you're right. (laughs) And, well, how are they getting out? It must be someone, a high-ranking German official, who smuggles them out. And he said, of course. (laughs) So the journalists built the story. Yeah, they planted all the answers to their own questions. Because the forger wasn't that clever a storyteller. Now, you, you've worked on other sensational forgery cases, one of which cost two people their lives. Uh, tell us about that one. That was quite different from the Hitler diaries. This forger was, was very good, and he was very, very good at planting the history of the documents that he forged. In many cases, he allowed other people to discover the documents. And what were these documents? These were all Mormon-related documents. He was not really out to make money. It is believed that what he was out to do was to really change Mormon history. And how did it come unwound? It came unwound because he went too far. He did get into the financial side of this after a while, and he sold the same collection, which didn't exist, but he told people about this collection, Mm -hmm. and he sold it to multiple people. Then the people started pressing him, and he got from me two Egyptian books of the dead. There's a lot of background here because Joseph Smith claimed that the Book of Mormon was dated from the 1st to 2nd century A.D. uh, and from Egypt. And I had two Egyptian books of the dead from that period. He cut them up and he gave people the pieces saying, you know, this is part, this is just to let you know that the rest of the collection will be coming. I called this guy 
and told him I was coming to Salt Lake City and that I was going to visit different people. And he realized when people started saying, oh, Ken Rendell's coming and he's a great expert in papyrus. I can't wait to show him the piece of the Book of the Dead. And he tried to kill me in Boston. Oh, my God. And he couldn't find out where I lived. And he went back to Salt Lake City and started systematically killing the people I was going to see. Well, there's a case that certainly didn't have a happy ending. No, it didn't. Two people were dead. It started to unravel when a bomb that he had to kill the third person went off accidentally in his own car. And the police believed that he was the third victim, but it eventually unraveled with the forgeries and with ATF saying that they thought he had made the bombs. And he's doing life without parole. So, Ken, early in your career, you began collecting World War II historical documents. I mean, this was decades before you founded the museum where I had the pleasure to look at some of them. Tell us about those early years. I think that my motivation right from the beginning was that nobody was collecting the artifacts and documents from World War II. I was born during the war. I recall in the 1940s the intensity that the war brought to the country. There was no other story. Everything was war-related. There were no consumer goods being produced. Everything was for the war effort. And after the war, people wanted to forget it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to move on. And I was concerned that without anyone collecting it, the reality of history would, would just disappear into the darkness of history. And I began collecting about 1959. I didn't have any money, but things didn't cost anything. So I started putting letters and documents aside and in, into a collection. Then I started collecting propaganda, and about 1990 is when I really started to get into artifacts, 3D artifacts. Oh, I see. I mean, you have things like Enigma machines and a Norton bombsite and even a Sherman tank. It's been quite a journey in collecting all of this. There are more than 10,000 3D artifacts in the museum, more than 500,000 pieces in the archives about 5,000 different posters, 10,000 books in the library. So it's become the most comprehensive collection in the world. It's the only global museum, which is, to me, very strange. All of the other museums are national museums telling the story of the war only from a national perspective and also telling you that they won the war. Right. And we deal with all aspects of the causes and consequences, all the different countries that are involved, the home fronts, the battle fronts, because I really want the complete picture to be the experience that people have. I don't want people to have a sense they come to the museum and they're looking at a memorial. I want them to relate Oh, you could touch stuff. That was the most amazing thing. And smell them. That's the experience that I want people to have. Because all of what happened in the 1920s and 30s repeats itself. And the most important lesson that people need to learn about history is that human nature causes people to believe things won't happen to them. It won't happen in their span of life because they're different, they're special. But in fact, they, it keeps repeating because people don't act to prevent it from repeating. And so many of the, the causes of World War II can be repeated uh, again and again. But how often are the lessons of history perverted by contemporary narrative? Even something as simple as a lesson of appeasement gets completely reinterpreted by modern journalists and politicians. Well, I think that just taking appeasement, that the issue is that good people can't imagine evil. And they can't imagine people who enjoy evil, who will do things only for the sake of evil. And that puts a good person at a disadvantage in trying to comprehend evil. You hear it in news stories every day in which authorities are trying to find the reason for something that happened when the reason can be 
the person was evil and they did it because they were motivated by evil. So, Ken, along with evil, there were tremendous acts of heroism in World War II. Probably the most amazing artifact I saw in your museum was a, a simple grappling hook and a rope ladder. I mean, just about everybody like me whose dad served in the Second World War knows the story of the Army Ranger scaling Point du Hoc on D-Day. Share that story for our younger listeners, and how did you come to save one of those very same grappling hooks? That was a, an, an incredible story of tenacity on my part. That grappling hook was in a museum right near Point du Hoc, and it had been found just after the Normandy invasion, along with a wire ladder that was used to get up the cliffs. The story of Point du Hoc is that this section of the Normandy coast was between the Omaha Beach and the Utah Beach landings. The cliffs were about 100 feet high. The Germans had enormous gun emplacements on the top because it was an impregnable position. But the American Rangers landed right at the base of these cliffs, fired these grappling hooks with using mortars to fire them, trailing ropes and trailing ladders, wire ladders. And then the Rangers climbed up the ropes, climbed up the ladders. Into enemy fire. With Germans shooting straight down. And uh, I believe there were about 250 Rangers that climbed up the cliffs, and a staggering number were wounded. Somewhere on the order of 160, 170 wow. were wounded or killed, but they kept on going. So how did you get a hold of one of the hooks? There was a private museum that a person had put together from things that he and his father had picked up and collected after the, all the troops moved out. And in 1994, the 50th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, he was convinced that nobody would be interested in the future. And he was concerned that he couldn't generate enough visitors to pay to keep his museum open. Hmm. So in anticipation of this, he sold the museum to me. And he was completely wrong. The interest in World War II went up dramatically after the 50th anniversary. And all of that material is now right here in Boston. You have an enormous collection of Nazi propaganda from the years leading up to the Second World War. What does it tell us about the spell Hitler put on the German people? Hitler understood the needs of the German people right after World War I. The German people had been defeated in the war, which was very humiliating to them. The military had created scapegoats for their own failures and blamed it on politicians. The German economy fell apart and there was enormous inflation. And Germany was in really bad condition, socially, economically. And Hitler really brought a sense of national pride. Make Germany great again. He, that was his slogan, make Germany great again. And he understood the needs of the people, and he answered them. He presented a plan for full employment, which he arrived at by creating uh, war materials and factories were booming with making war materials. So he brought back the sense of greatness that the German people lost after World War I. The propaganda that I saw in your museum is just so bone-curdlingly chilling. How could people not recoil when they saw it? Because it was really appealing. The colors, dramatic colors, something that is always lost because we're the only museum that exhibits this is the fact that Hitler ran two national campaigns. He was elected. Mm -hmm. The Nazis were elected. They were the majority party in the Reichstag. And we show the, the campaign materials, and it's like any political campaign. There are posters showing Hitler with children, with old ladies, with workers, with a shovel. The most important part of our Third Reich display is for people to see how a monster was packaged and marketed to the German people. This was the marketing of a war. The German uniforms, which are very stylish and very attractive, were designed by Hugo Boss, the same name that is a major fashion house now. Hugo Boss designed the uniforms and manufactured them, and the business just continued 
on after the war. So it, it uh, it's the first time that mass marketing was used to sell uh, a war to people. So, Ken, what are your long-term plans for the museum? Right now, visiting is by appointment only, but, geez, your collection surely deserves to be seen by many more people. We have to schedule visits right now because we have so many school groups. Three days a week are devoted to school groups only. We also have teacher training. Many school districts use the museum. We've had over 400 individual teacher visits this year, and we just don't have the space to have a lot of visitors if we have a school group of 60 students in the building. So we do have to schedule visits. We are planning on expanding the museum dramatically. We own the buildings next to the museum, and we have sufficient land and planning board support to build a new 65,000-square-foot building, and we're two-thirds of the way towards that goal financially. So we've raised a lot of money for the new building, and we hope to have this open in 2018 when we'll be able to accommodate all of the people. The museum is open Tuesday through Saturday, but we can't guarantee that somebody can get in. That's why we do need to schedule visits. Where can people go to make a donation to help you expand this amazing resource? I think the best thing is to go to our website, museumofworldwar2.org, and we have registered a sufficient number of names, so however you spell anything, it it will come out. (laughs) Well, Ken, thank you for the work you're doing. It's just been absolutely eye-opening to to visit your collection and, and chat with you today. Thanks very much. That was Ken Rendell, founder and director of the Museum of World War II, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio Hour on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And while you're at it, take a look at realclearfuture.com for daily updates on the next big wave of technologies. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Old Boston Restorations, for their support. Old Boston is a boutique property management company in Boston South End. Visit them online at oldbostonrestorations.com. That wraps up our show for this week. Please join us next week, same time, same station. See you then.